Hi everyone, welcome to THC and today we learn how to become better drafters on Star Wars Unlimited. So Star Wars Unlimited is a game that has been designed uh, for draft and it turns out there is not that many games uh, in the industry right now which are designed for draft. Um, pretty much the only other games that I've seen that was really made for drafting uh, which ha happened to become really good at dra uh, for drafting is, is Magic the Gathering. Um, but yeah, uh, so it is something that if you've never tried before, you should definitely give it a shot. It's very fun, uh, and it is very different from Constructed. Uh, it's a very good way, especially if you are frustrated with the meta, if you are frustrated that the meta is very stale, it's an excellent way to kind of stay engaged with Star Wars Unlimited, but basically uh, play something that is not obviously restricted to the meta, because obviously every game you're gonna every time you draft you're gonna be having a different deck and it's very fun so hopefully this will make you wanna play draft because maybe also understanding draft and be better at draft is gonna help you appreciate uh, the drafting experience if you're someone who already loves drafting uh, hopefully this guide is gonna make you um, better at it and make you enjoy and make you enjoy even even more so without further ado, we get into the first slide of this uh, of this um, of this guide. Sorry, is the first tip I'm giving you for drafters is to work before the draft, meaning that you should do your homework and have an understanding of the game uh, before you start drafting. It's obviously a good way to 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 prepare your draft. Uh, you can do this in two ways. The first way is to understand the archetypes you can build around the common cards. So in drafting, the most important cards are the commons because they're the one you're going to see the most often. They're, they represent the majority of the cards you're going to see in packs and therefore the majority of cards you're going to have in your deck. So what kind of archetypes are linked to the different colors? This is very basic. Most people already know this. Uh, Red-white is aggro. Green-black is uh, is um, is ramping. Uh, uh, blue white is based on sentinel units with equipments uh, and upgrades, uh, and so on. So usually people understand this pretty well. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much details. But the important part is that if you have a global idea on what a color combination does, it's going to help you orient your deck in this way and build your deck. To make sense around this, those different synergies. The second tip I, uh, I, I I give, and I think it's a much more important tip, is to have a good understanding of the power level of the cards uh, in the game for drafting specifically. So, cards, the cards that are very strong in constructed, might not be very good in draft, and the other way around is very true. And more importantly, there's tons of cards that don't see any play in constructed that are actually quite good in draft. So understanding the power level of the cards in constructed is helpful, but it's not the end of all. And you need to understand how good those cards is are in draft. And for this, I my best recommendation is to go on the Garbage Roller website. And in there, there's actually a, a, a player who's called Wu, who actually ranked every single card in and rated every single card for the purpose of draft with some explanation with it. So it's very interesting. And the first thing I would recommend to anybody who wants to become better at drafting is to read every single of those reviews. I mean, I guess you can just read, read the rating. If you agree with the rating or if you understand the rating, you don't have to read the description. But if you um, uh, see a rating that is different from what you think, or if you don't understand why a card is certain rated that way, then there's an explanation on how to. And I, I would suggest you to do that, to go through all those ratings, because this will help you prioritize which card to pick during the draft, which we'll, we'll go into more detail later. But that's, I think, is a very important part of drafting, is to understand the power level of the different cards. So these are like the two things I would do before uh, drafting. Um, so moving on now to uh, the the leader draft. So as you know, one of the unique things about Star Wars Unlimited compared to uh, Magic is that you start by drafting your leaders first. So three leaders uh, are going to be drafted, and the strategy 
of uh, what you're going to pick is very different depending if it's a first, second, or third pick. So on the first pick, it's very straightforward. You should be picking the best leader. So what I mean by best leader, once again, there are leaders that are better than others in draft. Once again, you can go back to the, the this guide that you can find on Gabriel. I will put the description, uh, the, the, the link on the description. And try to pick the, the leader that is generally considered the best or what you consider the best. As I said uh, earlier, so the guy that I've, uh, that I've pointed out is a really good starting point, but obviously as you're going to be drafting more, you're going to get more experience and you're going to be able to make up your own mind on the power of certain cards. But this is, a, I think, as, best as, as good as it gets as far as a starting point because Wu is an excellent player. So take the best leader on your first pick. Very simple. On the second pick, take a leader that complements your first leader. So what I mean by this is that what is very important in your leader is obviously uh, their, their abilities, but what is also important is the color combination they have. And if you pick three uh, villainy leaders, you're going to be in big trouble because you're cutting yourself out from uh, all the, the heroic cards in the game, which is very, very bad. Uh, in a draft, at the beginning of the draft, you want to stay open as much as possible. You want to keep your option open. So this is why I highly encourage you to have at least one heroic leader and one villainy leader at least among the three leaders you have. And preferably leaders that have different color combination. Yes, you can complement the missing color with a base, but this is another commitment that you have to make. So as much as possible, try to take leaders that have different colors and try to have at least one heroic leader and one villainy leader among the three starting leader you have. And the good thing is that because it is an open draft, the leader draft is actually an open draft, you know what are the, the leaders that are going to come to you uh, what are going to come to you, you know what leaders you're likely going to get past to you. And this way you can kind of plan ahead. And usually if if a player ends up with three black leaders, that's usually his fault. That it's usually their fault for, for, for mess, messing out because they didn't pay attention to what leaders were going to come around and they ended up with three villainy leaders or three Eric leaders, which is going to put you at a, at a, at a disadvantage. So the first thing is, of course, have strong leaders. But the second thing is to have leaders that leave your option open and allow you to play different colors and different strategies. Those are the two important things you have to keep in mind. Finally, pay attention to what is likely going to come to you on the next pick. So, so I already talked about this, but uh, it's an open draft, so take advantage of it. Uh, for example, if you put an if you, if you think that you're very likely going to receive only Eric leader, maybe you're more likely to pick up uh, um, a villainy leader and so on. So that's also something to keep in mind. So without further ado, let's, let's try to illustrate that by going through a draft. So this, let's say this is your first pack and uh, we got this, uh, so Gram of Takin, Leia and IG-88. In this pick, for example, I personally consider Gram of Tarkin to be the best of the three leaders. And picking this leader early is going to be good because it's going to orient my draft and say, okay, well, I know that I'm going to be prioritizing Imperial units in my draft because of this. Green-Black is also a very powerful color combination. Uh, if you've got uh, a lot of Imperial units, Gram of Tarkin is one of the most powerful uh, leader ability in the game in draft. Th therefore, this would likely be my first pick. This is my se second pick. So here you see you have two leaders which I would consider to be relatively equivalent in terms of power level, Jean Urso and Director Krennic. But because I've already picked up a villainy leader, I would like to pick Jean Urso because she complements my first pick a little bit better. She has an heroic leader, so she keeps me open on both heroic and villainy colors, as well as uh, being also a different color in terms of our... Uh, she's also cunning while... So she completes, she's a very solid leader in draft and she will complement my, my, my first leader very well, better than what Krennic does. And obviously on the third draft, you simply get whatever is given to you. In this case, we get a Chewbacca, which is a relatively realistic scenario. Chewbacca is not a very strong leader in draft, so relatively likely you get a good pick, something like this. But at least we get some. So, but once again, whenever you're drafting, really pay attention to what is likely going to come around. This has to be take, uh, the you have to utilize every single bit of information that you have to make your pick, and that information includes the cards that are likely to be passed to you. 
Now let's talk about the first pack strategy. So whenever you're opening your first pack, just like for the leaders, you're going to be focusing on taking the best cards. Uh, taking the best cards, as I said, refer to the guide. What, it, what is, do you consider the, the strongest cards? What I consider to be the strongest cards? But really, at the beginning of the draft, quality is what matters. Another very important criteria is to stay open as long as you can according to your leader selection. So, yes, power level is very important, but you do not want to pick a card that is a completely different color than the leaders you've already picked. Because this is going to commit you. It's going to, it's going to tell you, well, if you want to be able to play that card, you're going to have to play specifically that leader with that specific base. And that commitment is not a good thing to do early on. Because what happens is that um, if uh, it doesn't, uh, you want to be able, you want to keep yourself the freedom to seize opportunity later on in the draft, and being able to pick uh, to pick a wide a variety of cards, and committing yourself too early in the draft is not a good thing. So obviously, if you don't have any other choice, you you can do this. But if you have the choice between strong cards which are non-committal and strong cards that are very committal, you need to pick the card that are committal. And we'll illustrate that in more in, in some example later on. Uh, basically, by the middle or the end of the pack, of the first pack, you need to, you, you're going to have an understanding of what is open on your right. And let me illustrate this with this little scheme here. So let's say you are the player in yellow here. So the two other players here are going to be passing you packs. So those three players here are going to be passing you packs. So it's very important to know what those two, three players are actually drafting, because that's what is likely going to come around for you. Um, so if you have an understanding uh, of what those people are drafting and what they are not drafting, you can kind of draft what they're not drafting. And this way, whenever we're going to be passing packs on that direction again on the third pack, you know you're going to be passed only good things because they're going to give you all the good, all the good stuff. Because draft is very much a communication game where players are sending signals to each other depending on what card they pick. For example, if I'm getting past an overwhelming barrage, which is one of the strongest cards in the game, especially in draft, uh, let's say I'm being uh, past um, an overwhelming barrage on my third pick. So one, two, three. That means that the person who opened that barrage is this player over here. So I know that at the very least, this player and this player are not playing green-black. And that's a, what we call a signal. That's a huge signal. It means, oh my god, those two players are not playing this card. That means they're going to pass me a ton of great green-black cards later on in the game. So not only did you get a very strong card for your deck, but you also got a signal that says, well, this color is open. And I can play that color. And you need to be mindful of the colors. Same thing if you see that there is a disproportionate amount of green card or red card or whatever card that are being passed to you. That's also a signal. It means those are not being picked. And you can even see if you see, for example, overwhelming barrage being uh, sent to you after peak six. That means this player, this player, this player, this player, this player, this player are not playing overwhelming barrage and not playing green black because there's no way they would pass an overwhelming barrage if they if they were in green black. So that means this uh, green black is super open, and you should definitely switch your strategy to play green black. And this is where having a diversity of leaders really helps because it's going to allow you to be flexible and adapt yourself to the situation. So this is what I mean by uh, reading the signals, and sending signals is also very important. If you are passing. For example, if uh, you have, uh, for example, two very strong green-black cards, like, for example, you open an overwhelming barrage, and then you open another overwhelming barrage foil, and you pick the first one, and you're passing the overwhelming barrage foil to, you, to, to, to your neighbor, you are sending the signal, you're sending a wrong signal. You're sending the signal that, that green-black is open, even though it's not, because you're trying to draft green-black as well. So be mindful of the, uh, of the signal that you're receiving, but also be mindful of the signals that you're sending out. So opening two very strong cards in the same color in draft is not a good thing. Uh, so obviously, sometimes you're going to have to do it, but be mindful of the signals you're sending out to the players on your right, because that means that on the next phase, so uh, when, when they're going to pa be passing cards to you, 
they're they are more likely to be cutting you off the colors you want because you've been sending them really strong cards in those colors. So they've been playing those cards and then on the other side you're gonna get you're gonna get screwed. So now let's do our first uh, pick one uh, pack one uh, pick one uh, example here. So uh, as we said earlier, so we've picked out Jin Urso, Gram of Takin, and Chewbacca, and this is our first pack. What are we going to pick? So here some interesting things. So first of all, I want to be looking at the mono color cards that are in the colors of the leaders we're playing. So here in this case we got Crafty Smuggler for Jin Urso, which is a very decent two drop card. Uh, two drops are usually a high priority in draft because the majority of your deck is going to be made of two drops. Uh, we got Resupply, which is a very strong card and uh, also is non-committal because it can be played in any of those three decks. And uh, it's the least commitment card you can have. I mean, even least commitment would be uh, uh, true neutral cards. And it's also a very powerful card. So it's a card is keeps you open and is powerful and also in the color of your leader that you consider the strongest. I would consider the, the Gram of Tarkin the, the strongest of the three leaders here. Uh, some might argue otherwise with Jinro. So personally, I think Gram of Tarkin is stronger. But anyway, if you think that Gram of Tarkin is stronger, if you think Jinro is stronger, then you can change your, your mind. So Chewbacca is also a decent option uh, because it's in Jin color. But you see, because it's heroic and cunning, it's a bit more committal. Resupply can possibly be played in a Jin Urso and Chewbacca deck, while Chewbacca cannot be played in Tarkin. So that's the thing. So Resupply is a good pick. Wolf is also a very strong card that is relatively low committal, but here it's red, which is a bit more awkward because it means that to integrate this card into our deck, we have to add a third color. We have to uh, to add uh, a third red color uh, to our package. So here, in my opinion, I think that Wolfy resupplies are probably uh, our Crafty Smugglers are the three cards that I'm looking at the most. Um, in terms of strongest card, Echo Base Defender is very strong, but you see Echo Base Defender is very committal because if we play Echo Base Defender, we have to play either Camaria or Jin Urso. Uh, Echo Base Defender is not really great uh, uh, Sorry, with Chewbacca because Chewbacca uh, already gives Sentinels to everything, so uh, not necessarily ideal. It's okay, I guess, but pretty much, yeah, if I was going to play Echo Base Defender, I would be locked on Jin and I will be locked in playing green, which is... So even though it is probably the strongest card of the pack, it is the most. It is very too committal at this point. So here I would probably take the. Personally, I would probably take the resupply. It's probably something between the resupply, the wolfie, uh, uh, and all the crafty smuggler. One of those three cards, I would say. But in this pick, I would per personally take the resupply because it can be played in all three of our leaders. It works perfect. It's very non-committal for our main for the leaders that we that I consider to be the strongest with Shigam Takin. It's a very strong card, so it ticks all the boxes. Uh, let's take another example. Once again, pick one first pack. So here we have uh, Season Short Trooper, a very strong card that is exactly in our in our colors. Um, Vanquish is a strong card and also low commitment because it's only one aspect. But the only uh, but we'd have to play a complementary uh, blue base for Muff Tarkin and Jin if we wanted to play this with those leaders. And honestly, we don't really prioritize. We're gonna deprioritize Chewbacca because he's not as strong as a leader compared to those two other leaders. So here I would think about uh, Season Patrol Craft, also a decent card, uh, but once again, not exactly uh, ideal. Um, so here in this very specific instance, uh, the competition is a lot. Uh, weaker than on our previous packs, um, so I would think about. Um, I would actually probably play Season Short Trooper. It's relatively low commitment because uh, it doesn't fit with Jin and Chewbacca, obviously. But for Gramoft, it still opens up. Uh, we still can be flexible on our second colors, and Short Trooper is really an excellent card in draft. Um, it's a 2-3, very solid turn 1 play. We're going to need turn 1 play. It's an Imperial, so we can boost him. Uh, it's really a great combo with, with Gram of Tarkin because Moff Tarkin's ability allows him to keep him alive. And and the longer he stays alive, the stronger he gets because once you get to 6 resources, then suddenly he is 4-3. He's also uh, integrated himself very well into the ramp strategy of blue-black. Oh, no, sorry, of green-black in general. So just a very solid card. Uh, there's also um, Gideon, which is a very powerful card as well, 
but once again it is much more committal requires us to play specifically darken and blue specifically so there's different picks which are acceptable here um, but I would actually uh, uh, I think it is actually less committal to go for a green black card here than going for a blue because blue we will have to play Jin and we'll have to play complementary base uh, as I said we deprioritize Shubaka because of the um, because he's overall kind of a weaker leader. So this, my pick here would be Season Short Trooper, but there's different options that are that are valid. Um, moving on to the third pack. Uh, so here, a um, couple of uh, strong constitutions. Sabine is very strong, but very committal. Um, Death Trooper is also strong, but also very committal as well, so not ideal. Um, Escort Skiff is a decent card, and this is a low commitment card compared to the other two. Surprise Strike is low commitment and very high power. So here my pick would be Surprise Strike because I think it's the card that has the best power for commitment ratio. Uh, fits right in Jin without even needing a complementary uh, color. Uh, fits in Gram of Takin. It's an excellent finisher. Uh, it's a, uh, it allows us to boost a card. So just something is be careful not drafting too many cards that are not unit or removal. Uh, try to keep those number of those cards into your deck under six, like six under six is fine. But this card is very powerful. I'll probably take the surprise track here in this pack. Okay, strategy for the second pack. Um, if you've been cutting colors properly, you should be getting good stuff. So what happens is that uh, if you have been, let's say you are playing a green, and you've been selecting every single green black card ever and you think as many green cards as possible that means that the person on your uh, on your left is not getting any green black card is not getting any green card that means this person is very unlikely to be playing green or green black and that's that's good you've been sending the signal that green and green black is not open and therefore whenever uh, the the draft order is going to go on the other side this person is going to give you a ton of great green and green black card. Um, and that's the way it, it should work. And that's the way you draft a good deck. By the middle of the second pack, you should be locked on a deck. What I mean by locked on a deck is knowing what leader you're playing, knowing what complementary base you're playing. That's by the middle or the end of the second pack, you should be knowing, you should know that. Uh, if you're still wobbling between different archetypes, the risk that you're taking is that you're not going to have enough playables. You're not going to have 30 cards that are in your colors. Uh, yes, you can always play out of aspect cards, but it is not something you want to do most of the time. Uh, there's very even in draft, playing two extra resources for a card is a huge, huge cost, and is very rarely worth it. Strategy for the third pack. For the third pack, I would make sure that I have enough playables. This is the moment where you start counting your cards, and you're like, okay, how many cards in my color do I need to complete my deck? And from that standpoint, you need to be try as much as possible to play with as few out of aspect cards as possible, and obviously as few bad cards as possible. Sometimes some people would jam some bad cards in, in, into the deck, just in order to, to complete the, 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 the deck, that's obviously something you want to avoid as much as possible. I would say that most of the time, it is better to play a bad card in your colors than playing a decent card out of aspect. Uh, most of the time, that bad card that you're playing the full price for, that you're paying the normal price for, is going to be stronger than this decent card that you're going to be paying two additional resources for. Pay attention to your curve. Uh, curve is very important whenever you're building a deck uh, for constructed, but also in drafts. The idea of a curve is to have a distribution of uh, resource cost among the cards in your deck that allows you to play to optimize your resource spending every single turn. So let's say on turn one, you're going to be playing a two drops. On turn two, you're going to be playing a three drops. On, on turn three, you're going to be playing a four drops. On turn four, five drops, and so on. And for this, you need to have a good curve. So what does a good curve in, in Star Wars Unity look like? It looks like something along those lines. So one drops are the least important because 
uh, unless you are playing a specific deck uh, that is very aggressive and plays tons of one drop, usually you're going to have very few one drops. And the reason is because a game of Star Wars Unlimited starts with two resources. Uh, so on turn one, you're looking to play a two drop, uh, not a one drop. Uh, one drops are going to be more situational cards that are going to be squeezing in the curve to complete and uh, your resource uh, your resource uh, spending. Two drops are going to be the most important. There's going to be the majority of the cards in your deck. Uh, because you need them on the first turn of the game, consistently. Uh, the other cards, you have more time to draw into them as the game progresses. While the two drop, you need, to them, you need them right from the opening hand. Also, two drops are very convenient because... For example, on turn 3, you can simply play two 2-drops two instead of playing a 4-drop. So they kind of squeeze themselves in the curve very well. 3-drops are the second most important. You need a turn 2 play. You can do a turn 2 play with a 2-drop uh, and a 1-drop. But most of the time, it's better to just play a 3-drop. Uh, and once again, you only have one draw step to draw into a 3-drop. So you need a certain critical mass of them to be able to do that consistently. 4-drops are less important because... You can simply play two two drops, or you can play a three drops and a one drop on turn four. But once again, they are still important, uh, and you get two draw step to get into them, which gives you a high chance to be able to draw into them uh, throughout a game. But they're still important, and then so on. They are least and least, and uh, they become least and least important. Obviously, if you're playing an aggro deck, you're going to be focusing on that area. If you're playing a control deck, you're going to have something a bit more balanced where you need to have those those late game cards that will that, that will wrap up the game. So that's what, usually what a good curve looks like in draft. On your third pack, you should be mindful of uh, the, the the kind of cards that you have into your deck. You should be mindful of your curve and pay attention to the amount of two drops. You can have very, very strong cards. If you don't have enough two drops, you're going to be missing out on your early turns and you're gonna fall behind, so very important to uh, to um, uh, to have a decent curve. List of things not to do in draft. The first thing is to draft too many uh, cards that are not removal or units. So basically, the problem with cards that are not removal or units is that they are situational. They require usually a unit to be in play. So they are cards like upgrades or buff spells, or uh, all those kind of other situational cards. Those kind of cards are situational. So you want them, but you don't want too many of them. What it does too many means? Basically, if you get more than 10 of those cards into your deck, it's probably too many. Uh, so what are removals? Uh, removals is any card that allow you to get rid of a unit on the battlefield, pretty much. Uh, so it can be... Something like, uh, obviously, the Vanquish or Takedown, but it also can be some something like Traitorous, which is considered a removal as well. And obviously, units which would be who should be representing the bulk of your of your deck. Um, I don't, from my experience, you cannot have too many removals. Removals are always great in 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 draft, and you cannot have too many units. So you by picking removals or units, you always you are safe. Um, removal, of course, are usually going to be here to slow down the game. And most something you want to have in a control deck, where the units are obviously going to be for every deck, but especially the aggressive deck, of course. The the second tip I can give is to not counter draft. So the, the idea of counter drafting is the idea of drafting uh, a card that would not fit into your deck to penalize another player. And that is not a good thing to do for two reasons. The first reason is Drafting is something you do with five other or seven other players. So damaging your own deck in order to penalize another player around the table is not worth it. If it was like a, a 1v1 experience, then counter drafting would be a lot better because yes, you make your deck worse, but you also make your opponent deck worse. So if you make your opponent deck worse more than you're making your own deck worse, it's worth it. But in a multiplayer experience where there's uh, six to eight players around the table, penalizing yourself to, to, to penalize another player that you might not even play against is absolutely not worth it. Uh, the second reason is that is what I was talking about earlier is that very much draft is a communication game. So if you are counter drafting things that 
that uh, that you are not playing. So you, you you're picking strong blue cards to penalize someone else, even though you're not playing blue yourself. You are sending a signal to someone else that you are playing blue, and that is not a good signal to send because then the player is going to be like, oh, I'm not going to be playing blue, and suddenly you be you uh, on the second pack. Let's say you're gonna you're gonna get a lot of blue cards. Uh, you're going to get a lot of blue cards, even though you're not playing blue. So that's pretty terrible. Um, so obviously, there are circumstances in which you can counter draft, but those circumstances are very rare. They usually, of course, at the very bottom of the pack, there's simply nothing in your deck that that can that there's nothing in the pack that is good for your deck. So you're simply going to pick. You're not playing any of those cards anyway. So you might as well pick a card that is strong to penalize someone else. So that's the only circumstance in which counter drafting can be good, but that's very, very late in the pack. Um, so, uh, yeah. Next thing not to do is do not get emotionally attached to a leader card archetype. And that's probably one of the hardest ones to, to not do. Uh, we've seen this a million times. A player finds a leader and really want to build around that leader and try to force the archetype, even though the colors are not open, uh, and even though, um, so this is pretty bad because obviously uh, it it will lead you to to make bad decisions and to and to force an archetype that is not open, and you're gonna end up with a very bad deck. Uh, same when a uh, same can happen with a card. Opponents finds um, a look uh, look Jedi Knight in his first pack, and now he's like, yes, I'm gonna play blue white, no matter what. And what happens is that. Maybe blue white is not open at all, and you need to be able to let go. It's okay to let go. You're going to be drafting 42 cards, and you're going to be selecting 30 of them. So not every single card you pick is going to end up in your deck. It's especially very early on in the draft. It's completely okay to give up uh, a very strong card because y you know that something else is super open, and it's actually the right thing to do. So you need to not get emotionally attached to any cards you pick. So then you can make proper decision and 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 judge objectively what is the card, what is the archetype, what is the colors that are open, and what you should be drafting. A uh, little comment as well on rare bases. So uh, I'm sure some people are going to ask me the question is, what do you do with rare bases? So rare bases are highly committal because uh, by playing by picking that base, you're basically picking your complementary color. Uh, on your leader, uh, so that's a big deal. Also, it is not always guaranteed that the the, the ability on the base is going to be better than five additional HP on your base. It really depends on the base itself. So here, once again, I would refer to the uh, to the uh, card evaluation guide that I'm going to put in the description on the Garage Roller website and uh, written by Wu. Anyway, I hope this uh, was useful. I know that a lot of you are simply going to disregard this guide and simply pick the most expensive card, but this guide can also be useful if you are rare drafting because uh, the idea, of course, is even when you are rare drafting, which, by the way, I also do, I mean, especially if there's nothing to gain in the draft, might as well pick up some, some good cards along the way. But obviously, this guide will help you build a better deck even in the instances where you are rare drafting. Um... Thank you very much for following this uh, this guide, and hopefully this was useful. And I really hope that some of you guys who are coming from other FFG games that maybe have never drafted before will give draft a, 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 um, a go and uh, and have fun with it. And hopefully this guide helps you enjoy the sub the subtleties and uh, of this of of this game mode. Thank you very much, and see you next time.